Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. My name is Timothy Corrigan and I'm in the Penn Cinema Studies program. And I have some thank yous to hand out before we get going, uh, including to my own Penn Cinema Studies program, Temple's Film and Media Arts program, the Slot Foundation. Uh, I actually kind of like this it's background. <laughs> it adds a certain gravitas to these things. I think uh, uh, Jean-Michel Robaté, Ern Levy, Nora Alter, and most especially Nicola Gentili, whom if you've been to events before, you know he masterminds much of what happens when it's done here. I also want to thank Molly Nesbitt, who is here, uh, who has come down to help us with this event, and will be our primary interlocutor here this evening. Molly is chair and professor in the Department of Art at Vassar College, as well as a contributing editor to Art Forum. Her books include at J's seven albums and their common sense. The pragmatism in the history of art, the first volume in a collection of her essays, has just been published by Periscope Press. Uh, we're all here, I know, to um, hear a person who is truly a living legend in the history of cinema, and it's a great honor to introduce Iris Florida here. Um, most of you, many of you know her place in the history of cinema since the 1950s with the French New Wave, and for me personally, I think is instrumental in the, the age of the new documentary that's happening right now. Among the 33 films written and directed by Agnes Florida, there are documentaries and fictions, short films and features. The best known are Clio, From Five to Seven, Happiness, Jacques de Nantes, The Gleaners and I, <clears throat> The Beaches of Agnes, and Agnes from, there, Agnes from Here, to there. She's also uh, most recently become a very active visual artist with installations at numerous galleries uh, around the world, including the Venice Biennale. Um, I was asked also to point out that, or to announce that tomorrow night at the International House, um, we will be showing at 7 o'clock, is that right? 7 o'clock, uh, The Beaches of Agnes, and I just will be there, I believe, to yes. talk about the film at that time. Um, her films, you know, she would be doing a Q&A. There's also this Friday, beginning at 5.30, a symposium on Chris Marker, um, which will begin Friday evening at 5.30, uh, where uh, Raymond Bello and Agnes will start the event off. And then on Saturday, there'll be numerous uh, panels at the Select Gallery, beginning, I believe, at about 10 o'clock in the morning on that day. Um, I just learned films about many things. They're about relationships and friends. They're about different genders and different classes. They're about cities and about countrysides, about artists and filmmakers, about intensive, pr intensely private lives and intensely public lives. But most of all, I think, they're about temporalities and time and what it means to live fully and creatively in time. We're most delighted and grateful that Agnes Varda is spending time with us all here in Philadelphia this week. Agnes Varda. wondering why I'm here. <laughs> There's a reason. Um, because tonight we thought we would speak about Agnes's latest work, which is her work um, from, as she says, her life as an artist. The latest work you're looking at, the sound's now been cut, but it's called Bouche du Ronde. And we can talk more about what that means uh, in a bit. But the Hon being a river and the bush being the mouth of the river, and then, you know, things take off. Um, but it's a, it's a work that is actually now being exhibited, right, in Aix-en-Provence. Aix-en-Provence. And, um, until Sunday. Until Sunday, and in <laughs> Philadelphia for one night. So, um, enjoy. I'm here basically uh, to, because Agnes and I uh, met for the first time in, you know, for real, in 2003, which was right at the point when she began 
I guess we could say, her V. Bautiste. Although I think there's a way in which those lives of yours, and yes, are not exactly completely separate from one another, um, and we can think about that. But I'm here basically in my role as Q, and I'm yes, of course, is here as A. So I thought that as a way of beginning, that I would speak a little bit about the beginning, about the first of Agnes's works, which is called Patat Utopia, or Potato Utopia, um, which she did for a project called Utopia Station. My only visual will be this. Now, Utopia Station is a fairly complex project, but it got going in 2002-2003, and my friend and a uh, fellow curator, I guess we'll just call us all curators, um, Hans Ulrich Obrist contacted Agnes to see if she would like to be part of this big project, and which was being organized by him, uh, he was based in Paris, and by Rick Ritravanica, who was based partly in Berlin and partly in New York and partly in Thailand, and me, based in New York, we could say, but I teach at Vassar, so part of the early um, history of Utopia Station involves a meeting in Poughkeepsie. So in the winter of 2002-2003, um, we've been invited to do this project uh, called Utopia, we called it Utopia Station, as part of the Arsenales long, meaning literally very long exhibition hall at the Arsenale, which was divided into seven sections, and we've been given one of them. And Hans Ulrich and I were working on a book project, an experimental book project, which was didn't have a form yet, but it was an experiment. And we'd been working on it for about a year, and under the title Utopia, which Hans Ulrich had chosen from a list, and Rick Reap was making these works that he called stations, which he understood to be meeting places, really, where people would bring something, take something away. And so we hooked up uh, joint forces together to do this piece of the Arsenale exhibition. And because Tom Zorik and I were working on Utopia, and Rick Reap was making stations, we called the project Utopia Station, with the idea that um, None of us were trying to make utopia concrete, but we were looking in the direction of utopia and trying to get there and with our fellow travelers. So at the very beginning of it all, we wrote, I wrote a letter of invitation to the woman I was then calling Madame Valda because I hadn't met her yet, and I was polite. And I wrote her to see if she would come to Poughkeepsie, um, where a pretty good group of us was going to convene from all around the world, convene, and uh, think about what we would do collectively in this utopia station, which you'll see pictures of in a bit. And so I explained to Agnes, and the reason I'm giving you this is because in some way this is the brief we gave her, um, although whether she needed us to give us a brief at all is something we'll talk about. Um, but anyway, we had a brief, um, and we said, you know, that we were not trying to define utopia, that obviously there were these pre-existing um, definitions, and many, and we weren't uh, in the business of choosing just one or making just one, but we talked about um, a discussion that Theodore Adorno had had with Ernst Bloch in the 60s, in which um, they decided that utopia was could be invoked whenever one said, or was, whenever one said, um, or could see that something was missing. And that something being missing um, was a kind of talisman we used. Um, as something you know, to sort of point us in the direction of utopia. And we told them, yes, that um, Abbas Kiarostami had been asked about utopia. Um, he was not, in the end, part of Utopia Station, but um, he refused the idea of utopia. Um, and he said that one had to live only in the present. 
and take each day, he said, one hill at a time. And so we said, well, we're somewhere between Thomas More's island of utopia, this, um, the classic definition of utopia. We're between the island and the hill, and what we're going to do is build some stations, and we'd like to build one in Venice, and we hope you would come with us. Um, and the other thing we said to her, which I think is relevant here, is that um, as we proceeded to put the pieces together, and we hoped she would contribute, that um, utopia wouldn't just, this utopia station wouldn't just be, you know, a kind of embodiment of the idea of something being missing, but that it would become something at a human scale. Something touched, something changing into something else, and something bearing notice. And then we told them, yes, that, this, that there would be about 40 artists and architects who would come together to build small structures. And that we would produce a kind of swarm with them in the space. And that it would be on the one hand, a series of loose structures that were in a loose relationship to one another, as you will see. Um, but then also we were going to fill it with um, program. Uh, and that meant that there would be talks, there would be seminars, with the idea that whatever we did in Venice could go forward. Um, and it did. And it took many forms. It took an, uh, an exhibition form again in Munich. Um, it's existed as meetings, as a centerfold in the diplomatique, it morphs and um, not with, and it's added, um, how shall I say, um, participants, um, it's, but it's a very um, big, loose, um, sort of evolving project which wakes up and goes to sleep and now it's asleep. Um, but it was a not your normal art context. And so I think that would probably be enough to say about Utopia Station. We, um, Agnès, will, Agnès and I met for real in the spring in Paris. And then we met again in Venice in June while we installed. And at that point, the Patat Utopia um, was set up and became <coughs> You are right to say that. Installation. That's the way we met. That's the way I met what I call my third life. Because I've been a photographer for years. Then I switched to cinema. I don't know exactly why and how, but suddenly I was a filmmaker with no really special knowledge on studies about that. But when I made my first film, which is back in 54, I discovered I was a filmmaker. So uh, then I went on for years. So you have to go to, you know, you go into my little business, but I have to open that <laughs> so that so that I can call for to get a video reader, and then we put something in it. But you see, I'm a vector of the DVD here. So it is true that when Hans Obris invited me, I didn't know you at the time. And it was like when you are behind the door, you know, for years, and somebody just opens the door and you run. And I ran into the project. I was so excited. I didn't know too much about the philosophic meaning of that project and how it would turn. But I was invited to be in the Biennale. And on Biennale, it was a dream. But it is true, and I will show you, because what I did with some of my assistants is that all these things, I took some, I filmed something. Because this exhibition, you know, they, they appear, they disappear. Like the, the river that I showed you, which is ending on Sunday, I have to say that it, it, it is called Le Bouche du Hall because this is the name of the department where Marseille is, and Marseille is a, European capital of culture this year. So they asked some people to do something about Marseille and its department. And the name of the department being the, the, the mouth of the river Rhone, I thought just make it simple. Let's put the river and let's put some mouths. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it became what you saw. 
And I'm a Sidrific procession song, which is from the Magis. I think comes fine. We have a pope by here. We have a pope. Yeah. Yeah. So these little Magis, you know, they celebrate the pope and not Jesus, and that's fine with me. But I kept it because I love sometimes to do some direct things. Maybe it's stupid. And even that, I assume that I love to go directly. Mouse and river, Rome. fine, that's it. So I deliver what they ask me to do. And so the same way I was asked to do something in Venice at the Biennale, in a Utopia station, came, and this is true, you told me about that, you know, it, it came like naturally, and maybe I, sometimes I say things and then I say them in the narration. So excuse me if I repeat myself here and there, but this is true that when I did the cleaners, at the beginning of the cleaners, I was very impressed when I heard about this potato uh, cultivator, you know, farmers. farmers, that they had to make specific sizes to sell the potatoes, and whatever was off format, they had to throw it away. So I followed, I wasn't trust by the thing about the format, which is so, so much what we know in society, you know. So I followed what was off format, out of format. That's how I bumped into this. I was so lucky to, uh, to, to bump into, I think I'm the right place for that country, but to bump into something which made me feel so strongly that it meant something. The out of format with hard shaped potatoes. So I started to, to keep them and I was really, you know, keeping them Cultiving, cultivating, can you say, cultivating their oldness. And somewhere I kept in the basement, some in the light. And I was impressed by how they looked. So when I was invited to do something, not only I filmed them again, but I discovered that I could invade the space. Instead of having a flat screen that I love in theaters I've been working with, I could invade, I could have a triptych, not totally flat, open the triptych. So that's most of the fact that in the exhibition you can do that. And then you see, no, as the Well, see. the other thing maybe I should say is that there were three people at Utopia Station who were given rooms of their own, and everybody else had to share space. Um, but Agnes was, had a room of her own, which was a, you know, it was a sort of. Well, well it was a small room. room. It was the minimum to extend because it's got mets your trois, three spins, so it's quite big. Well, so it was it, bigger, than, find it was to put bigger it. than Yoko Ono's room, and it was bigger than Madonna's Nikas. She has about the same thing hanging Yoko. And it's very interesting because I'm small, but I always dream of big things. And to have big, three big screens in the shape of a triptych made me so happy. Now, do I have to, am I at the right place to start the thing? Yes, i show you. If I find, let me see. It should start in Venice, but I try to organize it. Nous sommes dans les années 50. I know. I have to jump, okay, I jump. That, because it's in that DVD, I tell that I was first photographer. And I don't know how to reach the point where I become. But this is a DVD that people can buy now, right? Uh, no, this one was made just to to know what I do. No, oh, okay. it's nowhere. <laughs> Sorry. It's special. Attends. Come in, come. This is a third portrait. But I think that's where we are. Where time. C'est à Venise qu'Agnès Varda a commencé sa vie d'artiste contemporaine. Elle connaissait bien la ville et ses îles pour y avoir préparé un film, La Mélangite. Et le détail d'une peinture de Gentile Bellini lui avait inspiré un autoportrait en 1962. Et la voilà de retour à Venise. Car Hans Ulrich Obrist l'invite à la Biennale d'Art de 2003 dans son projet Utopia Station. Chaque artiste devait créer une affiche et une œuvre. Agnès, ravie de côtoyer d'autres artistes, comme Boltanski, a créé un costume de patate, une affiche et un triptyque. Patate Utopia.
les pommes de terre en forme de cœur, découvertes en tournant les glaneurs, étalent leurs germes et radicelles sur trois écrans. Au sol, un tapis est fait de 700 kg de patates. Au centre, les patates respirent. that potato story I, I've seen and I've heard that some of you have laughed and sometimes the reaction of people coming into the say what is this potatoes and potatoes on the floor but you know that's what I have as an utopia in my mind is that this modest vegetable and not only modest but finished rotten not eatable uh, not consommable, comme on dit. Non, not to be consumed. Inedible. Inedible. In, in, uh, useless. Thrown away. But just l looking at them, and looking at that incredible texture that they become when they're old, less old, and at the end it's like full of little holes. I found that beautiful. And I had the, the idea that there is an utopia to believe that that's where the beauty is. That's where we can sometimes cross the first impression of, uh, is it not funny to make something about potatoes? Uh -huh. You know, we know the French fries, we know the, a lot of kind of potatoes. But at some point, I, I found myself so much at ease to deal with that, these old potatoes. And then I enjoy showing them your scenes, the three big screens. Then obviously, it came in the middle of other artists. No, you know, Boltanski had made as a piece, he had a concert of dogs barking to see the other people dare things also. <laughs> well, see, Boltanski, this is kind of interesting, he thought too about how he could, uh, you know, enter this project because it, it was a big crowd of people, old and young, and, you know, not just painters and sculptors, but all kinds of, um, you know, writers and architects and so on. Um, and he got in a boat with Hans Ulrich and went around the lagoon of Venice looking for an island where they kept the stray dogs, apparently. A beautiful island with 18th century buildings. And it all became very complicated because they were renovating the island and the dogs had moved. And, but the idea was that he would make a sound piece just of these barking dogs who found their island in a state of freedom. And, but failing that, um, he found some joyfully barking dogs. But it was something. And he just he piped them into the garden of the cats. They took the station. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a problem. And then there, he found another place in Venice itself where he hiked the barking dogs. And that didn't survive for very long because the neighbors put a stop to it. Um, and, uh, you know, across the garden, you could probably hear the barking dogs a little bit in Petat Utopia when the wind didn't blow too much. Um, but so, it was, uh, you know, it was a complete environment. It was a big experience for me to be among these artists that some of them I know for years, but not as, not, not as far as Samuel Jonas Mekas or, or 
Don's being a ghost on their mouth. She did well. Oh, well, I mean, it's a Jack Lee against Steve Carpino and so Mercury, then, of course. When you work on that story, you know, to which I end on with joy, mm -hmm. then, then I said, no, that's what I have to do now. And the next thing I did in a gallery was called Les Veuves de Noirantier. Should we show a little of that? Because I... Don't we want to see you in a potato costume? Huh? Don't we need to see you in a potato costume? Well, we, we had a little piece. Okay. I, I had to change the costume because I thought since it was the first time I was showing something and nobody knew me. I remember I loved the circus, you know, and when they had the circus coming in a city or a village, in the afternoon they do a parade, you know, they do a procession of oh, some of like them. promotion. Yeah, I thought I'd doing my self-promotion, you know, <laughs> with a potato costume. You know, it was fantastic, and I think we need to talk about this a little bit because no, when you know, you know, it's... It's I had a joke. I had a, it's a joke. It's a joke that was my joke. It was a finely crafted potato you walked around in. The potatoes, you were in a potato skin. It wasn't hard to. Well, the problem was that it uh, was an incredible heat. So, when I made the right. costume, I couldn't last more than 10 minutes because that is sauna, super sauna. So, I, I, I had to chew from my hands and my feet and my head. And when I was not there, because I didn't stay the whole year now. We had a mannequin and yeah. grass a costume and a little foot of my head. <laughs> <laughs> a paper doll on Yes's head. But, it, but now listen, because I think it's interesting that when you offer this work and you're thinking initially about how to make a, you know, a complete scene out of this potato utopia, that you put yourself in it. And you put yourself in it on prey live at the opening in the terrible heat. Um, but the but your idea, as I recall, was that you would walk around saying, "Come see my." my but I didn't yeah. say. I had a, I have a song inside my potato because I noticed in the very old book of of cultivating, cultivating potatoes mm -hmm. that there are artists in France we know two hundred twenty five different varieties of potatoes. So I recorded the list and I have little um, so, I I don't know, speakers. And out of my costume co was coming the list of all the potatoes. That then the Fontenay, you know, I can rec recite some of that. So I, I was not promoting my show, show really. I was making something odd. Anyway, people came. That was the answer. <laughs> well, and when, and when Agnes then left, um, the show went on, but with this potato costume, it stood right at the, at the front entrance of our Utopia station, which had an indoors and an outdoors. It was a wet comb potato. It was. <laughs> and with a, you know, the paper doll. And, but the speaker with the soundtrack of the 200 varieties of potatoes played. So you walked in and you heard this French voice reciting these very poetic names if you understood French. Do you know that years after, after the Venus, after that show, I received at least once a month a hearted potatoes in my letterbox <laughs> with no name, nothing. Sometimes they come in little boxes with a note, sometimes they're just thrown at my face. So, I, be I became an artist. But, 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 but you, you could, um, take them in and let them sprout? So that the potatoes so I still have them. I still have some aging sprouting, but I did the thing itself. So, so I turned into something else that I, I was interested because I've met many widows in the island of Noirmoutier. The triptych of Noirmoutier is a creation of 2005. That's not the one. Put to the left. Because I want you to see the widows. Okay. À Gand, puis à la fond. Well, you know what we could say, like, like, Puis à la fondation Cartier. The installation. Les veuves de Noirmoutier. Kind of video component, usually not always, but usually, and that they, um, the next ones exist in they exist in a dark room, so it's a black box, it's a video environment. And um, there is no more live component. You're not an actor, you know, like a 
you don't come in costume and do anything. Um, eventually, you'll appear again differently, right? Than these Very people. true. Well, this is the widows. Good. Maybe you have an idea. Let us see. Uh, I should push. Yes. Exposé à la galerie à Boukaya, à Nantes, à Gand, puis à la Fondation Cartier, les veuves de Noirmoutier. Agnès Varda y est cinéaste, vidéaste et installe des émotions en un espace intime et collectif à la fois. L'image centrale est un film en 35 mm. Eric Gauthier, à la caméra, a cadré le cortège des veuves au son du violon d'Ami Flamer et de la mer calme. Tout autour, sur 14 écrans, des dames de l'île, toutes veuves, qu'Agnès a filmé en tête à tête. Elles sont muettes, mais on peut les entendre. Chaque chaise avec des écouteurs correspond à une veuve. Chaque visiteur peut l'entendre. J'entends quelquefois des gens qui disent qu'ils parlent à leur mort, qu'ils leur répondent non, moi, non, pas ça. Non. Ça fait 13 ans qu'il est parti, mais je peux vous dire, comme je leur dis, c'est comme si c'était hier. Hein. Surtout le soir. Le manque, c'est le manque de toucher, c'est le manque... Pour l'instant, si tu veux, la maison est encore pleine de, de la présence de Thierry, de son odeur, de ses... On a mangé il y a deux jours des haricots verts qu'il avait achetés au marché, c'était encore... C'est encore tout récent, quoi. La chaîne Arte a souhaité diffuser ses témoignages de veuves, montés en continuité. Sous cette forme, le documentaire a atteint un large public. La version en continuité est présentée dans ce même DVD. Les mots des veuves sont les mêmes que dans l'installation. Mais pour Agnès, le dispositif qui isole l'écoute tout en rassemblant ceux qui veulent aller à la rencontre des veuves est plus juste, plus émouvant. Because, you know, it was recent I could do. I showed other things and in the two color plastic. But you had to make a lot of new work, didn't you? Uh, well, everything was new there. But the little bit of everything. And then I made a grave, a beautiful grave for my cat who had died. An animation with shells and roses. And then other things. but. I don't want to show too much because you know we are supposed also to speak about what it is. But I think in that exhibition was very interesting for me because the building has been made construed by Jean Nouvel, and it was a huge room full of light on the ground floor that I loved a lot. And when they say, "You can you do something there?" I really thought, you know, the light. This is it. I always say that it's in my light and time. Then I had the light. And I thought that, anyway, a film is, is light coming through an image. And I started to think about that. And also to think about the fact that I had made a film. I don't know if I tell it exactly. I had made a film, which was a failure, total failure, in 66. And now I have written a story called The Creator. And I had I was lucky enough to have Catherine Deneuve and Michel Picoli playing it. And we thought we had at least 52 stars opportunity, opportunities to get a bit to get it, and they didn't come. So the problem I got is related to cinema. As you know, until now, each film comes in reels. Each reel is, is in a can. And you have like nine or ten reels of the film is long. And As you also know, in the recent year, everything is changing now in the 
cinema roof screen instead of open. They, they wanted files, DCP files, which is changing the life of Joseph because it's so easy to send something which is not bigger than that. And then you pay for the key. You can screen it two times, a month, a week. So it's changing the, the, the way it, we handle things. But all these old films, by the way, and I'm into a big, big, in my company, which is company taking care of Jacques Denis film and mine, just two directors. But we have to now to restore the film so that if we want to see the films that I made or Jack made in the 60s, 70s, we have to turn them into DVD, into that on DCP, digital package, whatever what it is. But it is what we need in, in the theaters. So we have started to do some, but at that time of the Fondation Cartier was not yet a problem, and we had piles of cans of the film that didn't go, didn't work, was never asked to, you know, because then we, we, we pay the stock, we pay the thing. And uh, with the meaning of the gleaning and trying to recuperate what has been thrown, what is unled and useless, the, the, the I two ideas came together and I decided to make something out of it. So I hope I explained it, I don't want to repeat myself. Wait a minute. Des centaines de bobines, celles des copines ont demandé, étaient stockées. L'idée de recycler toute cette pellicule endormie et la lumière de la grande salle dessinée par Jean Nouvel ont donné à Agnès l'idée de construire une cabane. Une de plus. Sur une structure en métal de Christophe Vallaud, on a disposé les 3500 mètres des neuf bobines d'une copie et même un peu plus, une ou deux bobines d'une autre copie pour le toit. Pour les visiteurs, les deux beaux et bons acteurs du film, Catherine Deneuve et Michel Piconi, étaient soudain très proches. Des gros plans et de la lumière qui traversent la pellicule, c'est une autre façon de faire du cinéma, une autre façon d'y habiter. Because you know, you can imagine how I felt when I could build that, you know, which is like a, it's like a child dream to have a shack. And can you imagine? A filmmaker shack, that's what I had in mind. But you have to imagine the real thing, you know. We were many people with these square pieces of metal to organize, you know, all the 3,500 metals, you know, that we to put one after another to make. And it's made in a way that it can be undone. And, but anyway, so when we're doing it and work, wow, well, you know, it was, we're excited to, to do it and to have people come. But for me, it became very important. I understood at, at what level that I've been touched to imagine something that from my, I, I was a filmmaker, I am a filmmaker, that I could imagine something which, which will tell my relationship with cinema in the space, in the shape, with light and people coming. You know, I, you know then I thought I had much more audience to visit this then for people who came to see the film. So it was like revenge in a way. <laughs> <laughs> and you could see you could see individual shots, you know, if you looked. And close. we were careful to put at the at the eyes of people watching all the close ups, you know, so we, we calculated so they see some the close up because then you see sometimes almost nothing. And I realized that I was joyful to to imagine another way of communicating with people. And it still has, this is a very precise relation with cinema, with filmmaking, but I didn't film. I just filmed the exhibition a little to have memory of it, you know. And that, I, I didn't do only this kind of of inventing thing. I tried to to make different things. And I've been, should I show, you know, 
you like to see these things, or it, it's it's okay, because I, it's a film class, right? <laughs> yes. Now the other thing that's it's very interesting to me, and is to watch because I now follow and yes, his work in real time when I can um, get to the places where she exhibits. And as you can see, it's not always, as you will see, it's not always easy to just get on the plane and go. But that there is a, a way in which this, this way of working, um, it pulls from your cinema, it pulls from a kind of experience which is not just yours. And I think this is also true of your film work and it's true of your photography, that there's something older and deeper and longer in the kinds of stories you tell and the kinds of materials that, that you choose to focus on that comes through. And you have the sensation of that, even if you can't define it very well, when you go to the installations. They exist as very human spaces. Um, and they use rhetorics which are not coming from the history of modernism. They're, you know, they, they use another, other, other orders of form. And I think, uh, you know, maybe at this point I should ask the question that, you know, the artists in the room would probably want to ask you, which is, after these installations are taken down, do the individual components exist as objects that, you know, somebody can a collector could take away if they wanted to? Not Jack, my God, you need a castle. <laughs> well, they, collectors with castles exist, you know. <laughs> but do you see it as something temporary or something? I see them not. I made them and I have pleasure that I don't know after. But for what I know, there is a project to have the same thing made in the centuries at the Lachman Museum with another failure which the film I made in California called Linus Love and Lies. <coughs> and in the 69. And maybe we will redo the house with that other, that other film, with the stock of that other film. It's interesting to think that we can reanimate things that have not been seen so much. But would the film stop survive for very long? Hmm? Would the film stop if you... You know, no. let's say if you displayed it for a year, would it survive or not? We would do it with the film stock of a print of Lion's Love. Yeah. We changed, we changed the film. No, 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 I understand that. We have a new program in Russia. About the celluloid. Would the celluloid survive? Huh? Would the celluloid survive or would it fail? Would the celluloid fade in the light over time? Yeah, we had to, every three days, to the roti lamp. Because sometimes with the light would start to shake. Uh, okay. We were, you know, checking on the shackles. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, I know because I'm known as filmmaker, but I thought it was more funny to show other things that you don't have opportunities to see because they have not been shown here. I have something that could Well, you're also thinking a lot about all of this, I think, and you spend real time. Right. Sure. Sept, Agnès Varda connaît bien et célèbre pour son port. J'aime pas ce mot-là. Parce que en anglais on dit visual artist. Et je trouve que l'idée d'artiste visuel est plus facile à utiliser que plasticien. Parce que le plastique, c'est autre chose. Et le plastique, j'ai toute une exposition sur des objets en plastique. Alors, on va dire que je suis une artiste, tout court. On vous, si expose, vous, on vous expose de plus en plus dans des musées. Oui, c'est une nouvelle vie. C'est une nouvelle vie, c'est une troisième vie. J'ai été photographe, j'ai été cinéaste, maintenant je suis que artiste. Et ça me plaît beaucoup. Vous dites ça qu'un grand sourire. Mais oui, parce que c'est rigolo de changer de vie. Et c'est rigolo aussi que d'être pris au sérieux. C'est un peu comme des enfants qui font un truc et, et ça prend. Vous avez vu un peu les choses, là hein On est accueilli par des patates. Ben, par un monstre d'abord, qui est un très beau monstre, parce que vous voyez, c'est une ferme de, c'est une ferme d'Italie, une vraie ferme, et ils étaient en train de, vous voyez, c'est là où ils gardaient leur maïs, il y a même encore un oiseau. Mm -hmm. Alors moi, c'est moi qui ai truqué, là, j'ai mis les patates. Mais c'était l'idée de mélanger des choses vraies, que j'aime faire, le documentaire, à quelque chose de faux que j'ai installé. Et ça, c'est l'accueil en patate, et après on y va. Agnès a en effet amené son effigie en costume de patate. 
Et le triptyque, patate utopia. Les patates ici viennent sans doute de clermont les -Roux. Elle a aussi apporté les veuves de Noirmoutier. Il faut mettre des écouteurs pour les entendre. Il en faut mettre aussi pour entendre Ulysse parler ou ne pas parler de photographies anciennes Je jamais vu. et surtout d'une grande image qui porte son nom et dont Agnès a tiré un film. Une enquête sur le temps, sur le sens et l'interprétation d'une image. À l'époque, le petit Ulysse avait fait une peinture d'après ma photographie. Je trouve qu'il a fait un coup de vent un peu. Mmh. On dirait qu'elle attend un petit bébé. Et on dirait assez qu'il euh, qu pleut. La neige. Trop cher, la photographie. Euh, moi, je trouve la peinture très belle. C'est étrange. Puis... Moi, je trouve aussi que la photographie fait plus humaine que le dessin. Euh, plus euh, normal, un peu plus vrai. L'expérience continue avec une photographie et une vidéo tentant d'imaginer ce qui s'est passé avant le déclic. Non, c'est pas bon pour le fond, on bouge. Là, c'est plus beau, installez-vous. Donnez, donnez au petit agent Pierre, c'est son fils. I know I can show on two screens in a way. One still photography, which is a snapshot I did in the 50s. I was sent to do the, the Le Corbusier Cité de Cité Radieuse. But that intrigued me so much that 20 years or 30 years, 40 years later, I imagined what I thought, question, what was, what happened to these people? So it's a fiction of three minutes fiction that I invented with people dressed the same, you know, and on a kind of set. And we show it with a photo and the supposed action that could have brought me to do the photo. And I've done that now because I'm questioning the relationship between photo and cinema or photo and video. And in the next room, that's why I stopped a little bit, I tried something which is now what I'm doing these days to try to make portraits that they are made in old fashion with silver negative and printed on silver paper and, you know, printed and framed in a way and put in the wall. But then I do video that are screened and the video is like the two sides and again we come back to the triptych shape that I love so much. But this time it's flat. And the, the, the side, the ladders, what you say, the wings. The wings. The wings are related or not to the to the portrait. And in that museum in set, I showed two of them. I'd like you to see them. That's why I stopped away. Un pêcheur de set. Alice et les vaches blanches. Autour du regard immobilisé, c'est la vie qui bouge. Dans un coin de hangar sont jetés tous les éléments de quoi fabriquer une cabane de pêcheurs pour passer la nuit sur la plage. Au milieu du fatra et des murs, un projecteur vidéo et là par erreur. Ou bien s'il déclenchait tout seul. Le film qu'on voit s'appelle « La mer Méditerranée » avec deux R et un N. Il nous parle de la contradiction entre la paix d'une plage et la violence dans le monde.
you know, I was, I'm always really impressed by that, the contradiction, the two worlds at the same time. Even my first film was telling a couple, trying to understand what they feel, how they feel, and then a community of fishermen who had problem for their work, for their life. And I have that feeling very often, especially on these beaches where I love so much to be, that in the same time, and we know that in the same time we're here, discussing art, you know, that there is a war, there are people killed, there are people suffering, you know, dying from the war and all that. And the, uh, it, it's heavy also to say we have to have a conscious, you know, consciousness, but we have it anyway. And I wonder in that little thing, which is in the middle, you know, a bazaar, movie, you know, all the things for the fishermen are put together. The screening is not even on a, on a flat wall, you know, it's in the corner, as if the projection, DVD projector had started alone when we were packing it, they were packing their things. And I, I, it's one of these short films that I do now, I think it's seven minutes or eight minutes, in which you have the beautiful seashore, you know, so calm that you like, and then so many little, the, come on, you, the tourbillon, the l'horreur de la vie, the horror images that come to the mind and that I picked here, there, and filmed. And then back to the piece of the beach. And that piece is, was shown there for the first time, and I said. And since we are near the famous Paul Valéry, Cynthia Marin, what do you call it? Cynthia Marin. Cynthia Marin. So, since we are near, that's where I showed the, the little animation about my cat. We have that. On a déjà vu cette installation dans des musées, mais elle prend ici tout son sens, car le tombeau est à même la terre, entre deux grands pins. C'est tellement dur parce que moi j'ai pas pas d'indication en sinogramme, pictogramme et idéogramme. Cette fois-ci, des très bons dansants faisaient l'accueil. Les rues semblaient commerçantes et modernes. Et pour me rappeler mon premier séjour en Chine en 1957, on m'a amené dans le seul quartier ancien de Pékin, les Houtons.
mais la ville est essentiellement, oui, tout à fait moderne. J'étais invitée à exposer mes installations récentes au CAFA, musée contemporain de Pékin qui existe depuis 4 ans. Avant de partir, avec Christophe Vallaud, on a fabriqué dans ma cour la maquette d'un portique destiné à accueillir le public et à montrer les photos d'époque dans un présentoir original. Les bouts de bois d'un jeu de construction suisse, des pinces à linge et de la peinture rouge ont fait l'affaire. Christophe, une fois là-bas, a fait construire ce portique par des ouvriers avec qui il communiquait par geste, avec des plans, avec la maquette et des prototypes au format réel. Voici la moitié d'une pince à linge. J'étais très fière d'être invitée dans ce musée et de voir que la maquette était réalisée en 12 mètres de large, posée dans ce grand espace silencieux. Je vais ajouter un peu de musique pour accompagner la visite des photographies. J'ai proposé aussi de montrer des photographies prises il y a 55 ans, quand la Chine n'était pas encore reconnue par les Nations Unies. Elles ont fait grande impression, puisque la révolution culturelle a fait disparaître la plupart des documents d'époque. J'ai ajouté dans cette salle la drôle de collection des objets ramenés en 1957. Tout ce bazar était revenu dans une malle qui avait voyagé en bateau. Il y avait des chats en terre, des grattes d'eau, des chapeaux de bébé, des marionnettes en peau d'âne et des papiers découpés dont certains motifs ont disparu. Les Pékinois n'en revenaient pas de voir tout ça. La malle était restée chez moi. Je ne l'ai pas ouverte, je crois, jusqu'à cette exposition. Au même étage, il y avait mon exposition contemporaine. Voici des sacs exotiques pour nous qui ont été peut-être pleins de riz et de farine de soja et réutilisés ici pour apporter du sable. Il en fallait pour l'installation bord de mer que j'avais créée au Crac à 7. Une photographie qui se met en mouvement pour amener la mer jusqu'au sable. Le sable donc était chinois, comme les patates chinoises au bas du triptyque patate utopia, et comme tous ces objets, jeux, sacs et contenants en plastique de couleur vive, acheté en France, mais 100% made in China. <rire> Une salle proposée des portraits brisés, créés à la galerie Obadia. Ils vont par trois. Accompagnés d'un miroir brisé. Les jeunes Chinois ont très peu regardé les portraits, mais ils ont bien aimé le miroir. Quant aux veuves de Noirmoutier qu'on m'avait demandé d'exposer, on ne pouvait pas placer de sous-titres sous les images sans casser le rapport personnel de chaque veuve avec chaque visiteur. Donc, on les a doublés.
Vous êtes toujours dans le salé. On a vécu avec la Dahan, c'est ça. Ça te chasse le mal. 不自己一个人的时候，闷头无聊，我就和他说话。怎么说？这是一种标签，我很难接受“寡妇”这个词，真的。不过现在好多了，但刚开始的时候，我对自己说：“见鬼，我成了寡妇。”的话，可能把话的谁当的那么接，除非你听，是我接的。我把不过发的照片给你。我只是为了收拾，安排的歌，女方给我做编辑和设计，做这场旅程。在北京和在武汉，我被展示在故宫后边，因为她们。我的女儿 Rosalie， 马丽特约她和她的团队。Ils vivent et travaillent à Pékin. Et la troisième, Julia Fabry, qui a fait le repérage et la mise en place des deux expositions. Ici, dans le Grand Hall, en bonus facétieux de mon exposition, j'ai proposé d'adapter à la chinoise des plâtres de statues antiques offerts par une ambassade. Avant d'installer une tête de dragon sur un couple romain allongé, j'ai cherché dans Pékin une boutique qui en vendrait. On m'avait dit qu'en allant à la campagne, ce serait deux fois moins cher. J'ai donc été jusqu'à une très lointaine banlieue et trouvé un lieu comme un décor de film. Dans un improbable hangar, j'ai rencontré une équipe de la fabrique, tous très jeunes. Il y avait les masques des quatre héros de légende du voyage du singe en Occident, le Si Yu Chi. Je prononce comme je peux. Et des dragons. Clignant de l'œil et de toutes les couleurs. J'ai choisi une gueule rouge. Et parmi les têtes de carnaval, une pimpante jeune fille pour une matrone romaine. Enfin, pour des cariatides égarées en Chine. J'ai demandé à Christophe Valo de faire une deux chevaux en contreplaqué, à laquelle je m'accrocherai pour remercier Monsieur Citroën de Chine d'avoir été un des sponsors de mon exposition. So, what's next, Daniels? Not really next. I thought that you know, the, the going from one thing to another. It makes me feel that I'm free because I just don't do only things about myself. I've been doing series last two, three years, in which by while traveling around the world, I try to capture images of what I would see. But meeting artists and giving them the ability to speak, to tell what they want, to to tell you know to do what I do like. You know, giving some keys and showing what they do. And so, I. It's really a documentary with a lot of meetings. So I'm not always speaking about me. I'm not always expressing things. You know, I remain documentarist in a way. And I did. There were five, five episodes of 45 minutes each. That's what it's called. That's what it's called. The Sea de la, from here to there. And I gave time to artists that I really love, like Bartonski, who did a beautiful piece called Number Person, Persons, you know. And I spent time with Soulage, and I spent time with Barcelo, Barcelo, and with young artists that you may not know, and Annette Messager, and some are more, more known than others. That's in that series that I met. Is back in the studio and spoke with him, even though he thought, didn't want to give interviews. But since we were friends, he let me film the whatever he had in his studio and the way he spoke about. So I'm trying not to just remain, you know, just uh, an artist in an ivory tower, tower, which is not my taste. So sometimes I work for myself, and sometimes I get involved in showing other people work. But now these days, I'm more about artists than anything because 
the world is full of artists. And I like to be the go-between and make them be known. So I don't think we have time to show these kind of things, but. Why don't you just show the one from Portugal? What? Show Olivera. I cannot go just to Olivera. <laughs> I meet people also. I met some film director, like uh, the very strange Regadas in Mexico. Je sais pas où c'est Eject, je vois pas. <coughs> Where is Eject? Hmm? Where do I Eject? Ah, here. Here, it's Eject. Yeah, Eject. Yeah. And I was very surprised because I've seen his film Regadas very strong. You know his film. Carlos Regadas, yeah. And then I tried to meet him, and I meet him, and he's in the country. And he, plays, he speaks about his kids, and that he loves to play football. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> so I didn't get any information about his films. <laughs> but, but I met an interesting man. What did you want me to show? Well, you got it. That would be a great you cannot have only a very well. It comes after the Portuguese. Yeah. Is that why I speak about the photos and I showed again the same portrait of the video, you know? You choose. You don't want Potonsky? I'll take Potonsky. <laughs> I'll take anything at this point. Some of this I've seen in most Potonsky of the time. has haven't. made. So. I know it, she's. We can show a little bit of. Olivera, but you see, because I love Olivera and is an old man, and I feel I'm a young person, and, you know, I love it. <laughs> he, he works and he's, he's 102 or 103 years old. And I met him in, uh, in Porto, in this city. And, and it was interesting because he, I was showing my film, The Beaches of Alice, and he came with his eyes. Dès mon premier retour, I don't show. I don't show that. I guess not. Why is it difficult? Ask me to go. Come on. Alors, comment je vais trouver le chapitre? Il faut que je demande le chapitre. Mais bien sûr, on va faire les deux d'attaque. Plus loin, c'est la promenade qui longe la plage. C'est là que je retrouve Manuel de Oliveira le cinéaste de 102 ans, qui tourne encore, et sa femme, Maria Isabelle. Nous sommes invités chez le consul. Comment avez-vous rencontré Manuel Moi oui. oh, C'est ici, dans la plage, qu'il qu m'a vu la première fois. C'était quand Longtemps. Son mari en 41, 42 ans. 41. Vous n'avez pas travaillé avec votre mari Comment ça s'appelle C'est la ville de Colombo. Christophe Colombo. Christophe Colombo. Justement, dans le film, Manuel a demandé à Maria Isabelle de jouer. J'ai chanté une chanson très jolie, très jolie, dans les chansons de la trêve américaine. La dame qui est dans la mer. Parmi les invités, João Fernandes, qui dirige le musée Serralves où l'on montre mon film. Il a vu de Oliveira à y assister. Et ils viennent tous les deux. Ça m'épate. Voici ce que je dis à la fin du film. La sensation s'est mélangée instantanément à l'image qui en restera. Je me souviens pendant que je vis. Et là, je filme ce que je vis. Je suis l'invité qui filme son propre accueil. Après avoir répondu aux questions du public, je souhaitais encore écouter Joe et Manuel. 
travaille beaucoup au cinéma, même quand je ne filme pas, j'écris des de, de, de films. De... Emmanuel travaille sur les conventions. Il dit que le réel, réel n'existe pas. Il dit que le réel n'est que le résultat de certaines conventions, d'une mise en scène qu'une société organise pour, pour créer toutes les lois qui nous présentent ce réel où nous habitons. Et alors, c'est très important pour, dans, dans le cinéma de Manuel de comprendre que la société devient un artifice. Ce n'est pas le cinéma qui est un artifice. Et le cinéma de Manuel nous aide à nous éloigner un petit peu de, de ce réel qu'on nous impose à, de façon à, à, à l'interpréter d'une autre façon. C'est l'histoire étrange d'Angelica. La voilà morte sur son lit de morte et l'on convoque un photographe pour fixer l'image ultime avant son départ. Alors, le cinéma devient un exercice sur le réel. Une photographie, c'est en principe une preuve du réel. Mais ici, c'est différent. Je pense au film de Marker, La Jetée, fait de photographie, et soudain la jeune femme ouvrait les yeux. Ici, la suite de cette scène magique est admirable. Le photographe se penche de son balcon et regarde. Trois énormes camions citernes passent. Que penser de la réalité Dis, Manuel, est-ce que tu peux parler du réel et de la solitude La solitude Oui. Euh, euh, je ne sais pas. La solitude, c'est une chose que... Euh, je n'avais pas l'expérience. Pas encore. On est seul dans l'invention, non Non, nous ne sommes pas seuls. Nous, nous sommes euh, avec l'âme de la création. Et nous sommes toujours accompagnés. Nous ne le voyons pas, mais il est là. Les anges sont la configuration de l'esprit. Et l'ange gardien euh, L'ange gardien, c'est le destin. C'est un esprit. C'est un esprit qui dit comment. Nous, nous voyons que nous sommes libres, mais nous ignorons les forces obscures qui nous commandent. Et quelle est la force qui commande à Manuel de se battre pour de rire Contre qui lui ai-je demandé Contre le destin, tu dis. On croit que c'est fini Pas du tout. Le voici qui veut amuser ses amis. des questions à Rosalie. Il est curieux de ma petite caméra. Je la lui montre, j'explique comment s'en servir, je la lui prête, j'ai réglé l'image, mais pas bien du tout. Tout est flou, ça fait goût. Nous voilà, marie Albert, Manuel et moi, on a fait le calcul, on totalise 276 ans.
suis contente que vous me connaissiez comme ça, cet aspect-là de Manuel de Rivera. Mais c'est pour ça que j'aime faire des documentaires. Un seul. <rire> I'm glad that you have the opportunity to see the way Manuel Oliveira behaves. But when I like to do documentaries, it's because I learn things about everybody and about things. You know, I love the way that Jose Fernandez speaks about the work of Oliveira. What's that question about reality? Reality, what is real, what is not? What do we feel? Where, where, where's the junction between the fake reality, the real reality. I mean, the thing about the film with Veronica is an example. I think it's not useless, you know, to, to listen to people shake in the way ideas that we all have. What is creation? He said, you know, it's an, you know, we think we are free and we don't know. We are the way he says, obscure force, come on, force obscure. Obscure forces, yeah. obscure forces yeah. that maybe lead us, you know. All this, he says it, I don't know if I believe what he says, I don't know if he believes it, but it's, these, these ideas are shaped in a way to make us think and discover. And that's why I kept working on other people, you know, listening to them. And, and that's part also about when we speak about technique, these films, I've been able to make them with a very small camera that I could handle myself. I was totally alone in Portugal to meet him. I thought that well done, but it, it brings what we need from from Manuel. And sometimes when I did with some other artists and I was helped I had another video camera bigger. But the the freedom that gave us these new cameras allows to do travel and for me meaningful travelogues that the world is big, you know, you know, we capture an image and meet people and listen to what they say. So, at the same time, this is still doing my work of documentaries the same way I did that Tip, but that Tip has a shape of film. And this now, this is just video, because we don't screen them. This is five times 45 minutes. Some festival they show a little bit, but, and I've been very good mood to to go around like this and we discover people or discover people in the street, in the markets, and spend time with them. So I'm sure I wanted to see, I wanted to, and Molly wanted us to discuss about my third life of artist, quote artist, but I remain a documentarist because I love to approach people and to use my ability to listen to them and then to do editing and to do narration and, and to try to join and keep a kind of fluidity between different subjects and going around. That's what I like to do. No, but what's, what I also think is kind of great, and it, it gets us back to where we started um, our evening, is that the, the way in which you understand art really is to see it at a human scale, your own and everyone else's. But also, the art, what we call the art world for you and I think for many people as well in this room, it's full of artists. It's not just full of art. The art and the artists go together. You know, today. Life is around. Hmm? And in Mexico, you know, I remember going to there is a museum, beautiful museum, modern that they did in the university in the university and I filmed ice cream things, you know. But then I went to a market, I met an incredible woman, you know. And uh, she explained how she do the sauce, the mole, and that she needed 14 different things. And, you know, I'm as interested that, that I like that woman as much as I like artists I meet. There was another one, I cannot show you, see, but I went very early, it was very hot, so I went at 7.30 in the morning in the market, somewhere in Mexico City. I think it's called Tlaplan, it's just, I mean, a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I was so in the morning. I entered the market from the <coughs> side entrance. And here's that woman, old woman, in a uh, evening, you know, you know, a dress is pink, satin, you know, like for to go for a bath. Come on, tell her, and it's for dance, you know, at night. Yeah. And she has a lot of jewelry. And she kept one big hoodie. She had not finished her hair. <laughs> and, and you know what she, what she was grooming? the entrance. 
And I said, what do you do? I said, well, I love the market to look clean in the morning. She looked like to go to a bar, she was funny. <laughs> and what was her, she was selling little mink, um, rice, little cookies and knitting little shoes to sleep, you know. So that was her, her shop. But she wanted the market to, and I felt so touched because she looked like, you know, I don't know, from another world, you know. So did you film her? Y yes, I did, but I cannot show you, see. Just to say, sometimes I speak about that, to say that I wouldn't miss these kind of images. In the same time, I wouldn't miss to go to a museum or to meet a new artist and try to get something out of them. That's the thing I go that art goes into life and life, into art that I've been trying to, just to express because that's the way I live. And you always have. Uh oh, I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Should we clap for <laughs>